come back to the next episode of What's Up, Prof. Hello, Walter. Hello. It's getting close to the end of the year. Yes. What a year this has been. It's been an amazing year, yes. Let's get right into it. I'll open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for keeping us this whole year. And thank you for giving us the privilege of doing these discussions. We once again ask that you bless the discussion and always enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Martin, we have been threatening to talk about heaven for a long, long time. I think more or less since episode one. Yes. And we would get there. <laughs> Every time we're going to get there. Yes, because it's part of the book of Revelation as well, as, many, as well as many other places in the Bible. But uh, we've had so much bad news in this year, which is actually exciting news. Yeah. And uh, if rightly interpreted, that not really bad news, but good news. Yes. Because it means that we're we're coming to a climax. Yeah. We're getting we're there. Heading ca- and ca- today uh, we have finally got to the point where we can actually talk about heaven. But before we get to heaven, we first have to go through a bump or two, right? Yes. And we've titled this one, Heaven is Real. Because there are so many theories out there where they allegorize the stories Mm. and spiritualize them. Yes. And then nothing is reality. Everything is ghostly. And there's nothing really that you can, you know, tangibly Mm. touch. And uh, the book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 11 that faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not Not seen not seen yes so it is tangible it is substance of those things that you hope for and evidence of those things that you haven't seen so let's jump into it and we'll start with with john chapter 14 Because to me, John chapter 14 from verse 1 has always been a mini summary of the entire Bible. Yeah, it's a beautiful part. It's a beautiful verse, isn't it? There's so much doctrine in this verse that if people would only believe it and not spiritualize it away, they would not be so confused. Uh, You told us in your your testimony that this had quite an effect on you. Yes. There's a huge effect on me. Because it solved your your sleep and death and all those issues. Yeah. Right? Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Depending on what uh, <laughs> translation, translation you have, yeah. yes. The King James gives you mansions. The others give you houses. And some only give you rooms. rooms. And some give you some space. <laughs> And let's stick to this one. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way you know. Now we know the way, Mm -hmm. because he is the way, the the truth, and the life. We have to believe in him. He said he was going to come again. And so he will come again if you believe in him. Yes. He said he was going to prepare a place for us, a physical place, and he will come so that we can live where he lives too. Yes. And he didn't ascend into heaven as a ghost because the angel said, the same Jesus, the one that just ate out of your hands, that this same Jesus will come in like manner. In like manner. Also the way he went Correct. In the air. So no spiritualization like the spiritists do, like Blavatsky wants everybody to believe Mm -hmm. that this is the ushering in of a new age, Mm -hmm. a spiritual age. There is no real Christ. He was overshadowed. All this nonsense. This is a literal explanation. No change in your mind from 3D to 5D. Nothing. This is a, a world of reality. 
Now the new heaven and the new earth. Revelation 21 verse 1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now the ocean, of course, was what uh, came after the flood. There was no ocean before, but there were huge inland lakes and rivers and must have been very beautiful. Oceans separate people. So there will be no more separation. There will no more, even if you take it in the prophetic sense, the, the oceans, the waters, the sea, or nations. nations yeah. We will be one. No we will different still have nations. You will still have your identity, yeah. but you won't be separated into blocks where you have to cross borders, right? And there's a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. The Lord is soon to come. There must be a refining, a winnowing process in every church. For there are among us wicked men who do not love the truth or honor God. We are in the shaking time, the time when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. The Lord will not excuse those who know the truth if they do not in word and deed obey his commands. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 6, page 332. And this is, of course, true because the Bible says there will be a judgment. So there is some work to be done, mm -hmm. some refining of char character. And the Church right now mustn't be judged by the people that are in the Church yeah. because there are even wicked men. I mean, we've been saying this numerous times. Yes. So we must look at what is taught yes. and not look at the individuals. And even the best of men and women have bad days. And we have to forgive each other until probation close, okay. closes. Yes. 70 times, 7 times. So James admonishes us in chapter 5, Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. So the church will go through a process. There was an early rain when the church was founded and there will be a latter rain when the final message goes to the world. But we have to be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Now this entire year we've been talking about the signs of the times. We've been talking about the nations are angry. Mm. We've been talking about legislation that suppresses your individuality, uh, that threatens your very yeah. current God existence. That tells your freedom, everything. But these are signs that we should actually really be working at our hearts. Yes. Uh, though that verse 9, grudge not against another. Yeah. And I think the closer we get to the end, the more prevalent it will be that you have to do that because it's going to get so much worse. The uh, friction uh, is going to get so much worse. And there will be more. a tremendous shaking. And we can already see it. I mean, there are people that even within the church that are at loggerheads about issues of doctrine and mm -hmm. they're so militant about all of these things. And there will be a last call for humanity. God has called this people to give to the world the message of Christ's soon coming. We are to give to men the last call to the gospel feast, the last invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Thousands of places that have not heard the call are yet to hear it. This is where the internet comes in, right? Mm -hmm. It's really reaching places that nothing else can. The internet and um, cell phones. Yes. Many who have not given the message are yet to proclaim it. Again, I appeal to our young men. Has not God called upon you to sound this message? This is a, a reality that we're talking about. Not a spiritual shift in dimension and time. This is a real world. 
And we are admonished to talk it, to pray it, and to believe it. The Lord is soon coming. Talk it, pray it, believe it. Make it part of the life. You will have to meet a doubting, objecting spirit. But this will give way before firm, consistent trust in God. When perplexities or hindrances present themselves, lift the soul to God in song and thanksgiving. Gird on the Christian armor and be sure that your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Preach the truth with boldness and fervor. Remember that the Lord looks in compassion upon this field and that he knows its poverty and its need. The efforts you are making will not prove a failure. We must tell people that what we believe is a reality. It has substance. Mm -hmm. It's not an airy-fairy something. And this also tells us to keep, um, keep hope yes. and keep the faith. Absolutely. Uh, don't give up because a lot of times, especially these days, you get discouraged when bringing the good news to somebody. Yes, and there's and so much opposition. Opposition. So be filled with joy. We should be filled with joy at the thought of Christ soon appearing. To those that love his appearing, he will come without sin unto salvation. So you must love his appearance. I mean, that's a Bible verse that's being quoted, quoted right there. You must love his appearing. People always say, I'm not ready. I don't want him to come. <laughs> no. You'll never be ready. You'll never be ready. You'll never be ready. And if you don't start looking forward to it, when are you going to look forward to it? No, no. What generation will finally say, okay, we're ready. Yes, we're looking forward to it. Not going to happen. But if our minds are filled with the thoughts of earthly things, we cannot look forward with joy to his appearing. Now, the world is really helping us there mm -hmm. because they're taking away all the joy of being on this planet Yes. so that you know people will start, start thinking about yeah. heavenly things. It'll be a glorious day of victory. We must not forget that now the church is militant. Now we are confronted with a world in darkness, almost wholly given over to idolatry. But the day is coming when the battle will have been fought, the victory won, the will of God is to be done in, on earth as it is done in heaven. So this heaven that we are reading about here must be a real place. Yes. Because earth is a real place. You can't um, compare it with earth. And then all of a sudden, once you've gone from the literal earth, you go to the spiritual heaven. Exactly. All will be a happy, united family, clothed with the garments of praise and thanksgiving, the robe of Christ's righteousness. All nature in its surpassing loveliness will offer to God a tribute of praise and adoration. The world will be bathed in the light of heaven. The light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold greater than it is now. The years will move on in gladness. Over the scene, the morning stars will sing together, and the sons of God will shout for joy, while God and Christ will unite in proclaiming, There shall be no more sin, neither shall there be any more death. These are literal promises. If you believe in reincarnation, you believe in perpetual death. Yeah. But the Bible says it is given for man once to die and thereafter the judgment. Yeah. So you're immortal, but you're immortal in hell. Exactly. That doesn't make sense. How no, like that's the one doctrine. The other one is that you come back and come back and come back yeah. and uh, have this eternal battle against your alter ego. In the quotation... She mentions that the moon will be as bright as the sun and the sun will be seven times more. But there's also a part in Revelation that says the sun won't be necessary. Yes. Well, obviously, in the city, the light will be Christ himself and he outshines the sun. Mm. So you won't need the sun in the city. doesn't mean that it won't be yeah. there. It will be there on the rest of the world. But it will be seven times brighter. Yeah. In other words, and the moon will be like the sun. So what we consider light today in terms of heaven is actually darkness. Yeah. Our eyes will have to 
be reorganized and recreated in yeah. order to cope with that. So but we'll come to that yeah, later. That's fine. It, will, it actually says there won't be any darkness if the moon is like the sun. Absolutely. There's no way. Ephesians 3 verse 7, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. And to me who am less than the least of all the saints is this grace given that I should preach amongst the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's actually everybody's duty. We are all sinners. And yet he has chosen a fallen humanity to proclaim his glory. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So there's this conflict between the doctrine of devils mm -hmm. and the doctrine of God. The church has been given the doctrine of God and the devil has the occupation of preaching the doctrine of devils. And people must make a choice between the two. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. So don't look at individuals and say, well, if this one is going through so much tribulation, what kind of a God is he serving, yeah. right? Yeah. Or like people say all the time. Where's God in all of this? Yes. The very fact that it's such a mess means that God is working, right? And it means that he's um, reliable because he said it will be like this. Exactly. Now before this great event takes place, there will be this final message that goes out and there will be this contrast between light and darkness and there will be a final great tribulation and plagues. Now we're not going to deal with them. I'm just going to read a little bit of Revelation chapter 15. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over the mark and over the number of his name, Stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and they sing the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. So after the plagues there will be a resurrection of the righteous dead. The righteous living will be translated in the moment in a twinkling of an eye they will meet the Lord in the air and they will stand on the sea of glass. And they will sing the song of Moses which was a song of physical deliverance from bondage. Yeah. And they will sing the song of the Lamb, which is also a deliverance from bondage in terms of sin. You have the righteousness back, so you have all of these intermingled. You have this physical salvation from bondage, physical bondage, and you have the spiritual release from the bondage of sin. So they'll sing both songs. Mm. It's beautiful. Beautiful. And the Lord will be the one who is the judge. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. So you actually see the law of God, which was the standard of judgment. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts 
gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And this is a very important sentence. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Mm. You know, we have this theology in the world that when you die, you go to heaven. Yes. Now we saw in the very first verse that you go to heaven when he comes again, right? Yes. That's I what you discovered. Yes, I come to come and fetch you to yes, be where I am. So that you can be where I am also. And here again it is reiterated yeah. that nobody goes to heaven until the seven plagues have fallen. So just like literal Israel was on this earth and had to go through the that plagues. experience. Yeah. It's interesting there were ten plagues in Egypt, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The first three affected both the Egyptians and, and the, the Israelites, Israel. but seven only affected the Egyptians. Egyptians. And here there are only seven. So that's actually a promise that yes. God's people won't be affected by the plagues, only the wicked. But they will go through it. They will go through it. Yes. And nobody enters until they have fallen. Yeah. So it's exactly an uh, anti-type of what happened in typical Egypt with a physical deliverance. So also this makes of null and void the rapture theology. Absolutely. So that there is a pre-rapture and yeah. then there is a conversion here. That doesn't take place. No, because doesn't nobody happen. can enter that place. Correct. Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins has quickened us together with Christ by grace you are saved and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. This is a very interesting verse. When you become converted, you actually partake of heaven already through your faith in Christ mm -hmm. and through your faith in what is to come. But then, faith must meet substance. Mm -hmm. That's the definition. That's it. If it remains faith, then you have a spiritual world, a spiritualized world. Whereas here it says, in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. Chapter 3 verse 10 says, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church what the manifold wisdom of God is. So there is a future to look forward to, mm -hmm. but now we are in the preaching phase. Yes. We're not in the in the physical experiencing phase. But the whole um, experience is starting now. Absolutely. So in your mind, mm. even when the turmoil is around you, you can actually be in heavenly places. And you make, that makes it so important to realize that your way to heaven starts here Absolutely. and now. Yes. So it's not by a change, all of a sudden now I'm, going to be ready and now I'm going to enjoy heaven. Exactly. If you don't start this side already of heaven, aligning your thoughts and so and your life and so on with the type of life in heaven, there's going to be too much of a gap to go to heaven. Exactly. We are still amidst the shadows and turmoils of earthly activities. Let us consider most earnestly the blessed hereafter. Let our faith pierce through every cloud of darkness and behold him who died for the sins of the world. He has opened the gates of paradise to all who receive and believe in him. Isn't that beautiful? Very beautiful. To them he gives power to become the sons and daughters of God. Let the afflictions which pain us so grievously become instructive lessons teaching us to press forward towards the mark of the prize of our high calling in Christ. Let us be encouraged by the thought that the Lord is soon to come, 
Let this hope gladden our hearts. Yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Hebrews 10.37 Blessed are those servants who when their Lord comes shall be found watching. This is the attitude we must have now. And the worse it gets, the more our attitude should be focused on this issue. Exactly. Let it be instructive lessons. Yes, let it be yes. instructive lessons. Yeah. You know, this is not only a coping mechanism, mm. because this is actually a reality. Correct. It is something to look forward to. Once I have been through this desert, there's an oasis on the other side. Isn't it? Uh, I know I live like... Uh, if there's something to look forward to, then I can so much more cope with what's going on. Exactly. If you have the end of the year holiday to look f f this the last two months of the year become bearable. Okay, because you've got something to look because forward you look, to. Because you've got something to look forward to. The, so I think that's how you should look at heaven as well. Yes. So we're homeward bound. We are homeward bound. He who loved us so much as to die for us has built it for us a city. A real city. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you believe that a real city is going to come down on this earth like a huge mega spaceship and come and land on this earth? Are you insane? <laughs> That's what people will say, right? Yeah. Well, now I with, believe. With God, all things are possible, aren't they? Yes. The new Jerusalem is our place of rest. There will be no sadness in the city of God, no wail of sorrow. No dirge of crushed hopes and buried affections will ever more be heard. Soon the garments of heaviness will be changed for the wedding garment. Soon we shall witness the coronation of our king. I cannot wait for that king. A king of righteousness as opposed to what the world dishes up right now. Yeah, a leader that will come and everything he promised he actually will come and deliver. Those whose lives have been hidden with Christ, those who on this earth have fought the good fight of faith, will shine forth with the Redeemer's glory in the kingdom of God. It will not be long till we shall see him in whom we are hopes of eternal life are centered. And in his presence all the trials and sufferings of this life will be as nothingness. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward, for you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Look up, look up, and let your faith continually increase. Let this faith guide you along the narrow path that leads through the gates of the city of God into the great beyond, the wide, unbounded future of glory that is for a redeemed. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until you receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. James 5, 7 to 8. Actually, that's a compilation of Bible verses. Yes. And it is so beautifully strung together mm -hmm. that it makes a story of a reality which men have lost sight of. Correct. Do you know that song, Heaven is a Place on Earth? Mm. God forbid <laughs> <laughs> that heaven should be a place on earth. As the ransomed ones are welcomed to the city of God, there rings out amongst the air an exultant cry of adoration. The two Adams are about to meet. Mm. That must be quite a moment, right? Yeah. The Son of God is standing with outstretched arms to receive the Father of our race, the being whom he created who sinned against his Maker and for whose sin the marks of the crucifixion are borne upon the Savior's form. As Adam discerns the prince of the cruel nails, he does not fall upon the bosom of his Lord, but in humiliation casts himself at his feet, crying, Worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Tenderly the Savior lifts him up 
and bids him look once more upon the Eden home from which he has so long been exiled. An allegory? No. You believe it? I believe it. I believe it's tangible and it will be a reality. Okay. And it will be wonderful. So what does the Bible tell us about heaven? We must talk about heaven. We've now been through the plagues again. <laughs> 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 Unfortunately, there's always some thorns that you have to get through to go to the yeah, nice place. I don't know why. My, my wife, uh, when she was a child, she didn't like uh, stiff porridge. And so her parents or her mother always told her that if she wants to get... They were atheists, actually. They were mocking, right? But they were saying, if you want to get to heaven... You have to eat through a wall of porridge. Cold stuff <laughs> Cold porridge. Cold stuff <laughs> porridge. <to> get there. <laughs> yeah. The new heaven and the new earth. Now, Revelation chapter 21 is actually a beautiful chapter. And we've spoken so much about Revelation. And we might as well finish it, right? We might Absolutely. as well read the good news. Yeah. We've been in Revelation 13, we've been in Revelation 11 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 17 and <laughs> plagues and, and uh, masks and uh, <laughs> viruses <laughs> and <laughs> pandemics and <laughs> pandemics and you name it. But uh, this is just as real as anything else, right? Correct. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. He sees a literal city. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. You will see God face to face. Mm. He will literally... Be amongst his people. No more veil. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Can you imagine a God like that? Now, in an earthly situation when a child falls and hurts itself, and a parent picks that child up and comforts it, that's sort of a mini representation of a much greater reality. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. This is not an allegory. You can this, believe it. This is a reality. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues. And he talked with me saying, come hither and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. So here you have a contrast. These were the very angels that brought about a great destruction. And now they're showing the reward. You have this contrast. And he carried me away in the spirit to the great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So this is not talking about a Jerusalem that is somewhere in the Middle East mm -hmm. that is not from heaven but is from this earth down here. No. Having the glory of God and a light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And then it describes the city. It had 12 gates and uh, the tribes were, names of the tribes were written on it. And it had the east gates and three on the north, etc., and the walls of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the 12 apostles of the Lamb showing the inseparate nature of the Old and the New Covenant, the Old and the mm. New Testament. Wow. And the city was measured and the gates thereof and the wall thereof and the city lies four square and the length is as large as the breadth and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length of the breadth and the height of it are equal. So now, there's some speculation about what this... This is enormous. Yeah. This city is large enough 
to hold the entire population of humanity. It's a huge city, and it's incredibly high, hundreds of kilometers high. Now, this city is built in a square, and the sides of the, of the square are, of course, equal, mm. but it is as high as it is wide. Now, what is it? Is it a cube or is it a pyramid? The pyramid. It could be a pyramid, mm -hmm. right? Because that would also be the same thing. Now, if you go to the pyramids, that's exactly how they are designed. Now, there is one who is a counterfeit, the one who believes that he is the prince of this world, mm -hmm. and he tries to counterfeit the things of God. And the pyramid yeah. is his structure. It's one. It's so occultic and everything he's totally swung it on his way yes can it be a, a cube as well it could be a cube because it's as wide as it is high mm -hmm. now in the occult you also have cubes mm -hmm. that they use but my personal feeling is maybe maybe it's a pyramid but i'm, I'm not going to be dogmatic on that one right and he measured the wall thereof, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the, so the walls are incredibly thick. And the building of the wall is of jasper, and the city was pure gold like unto clear mm -hmm. glass. So the gold is so pure that you can actually look through, through it. it yeah. Amazing. And then it talks about the foundation of the city that were garnished with all kinds of precious stones. And, uh, you know, there's a video going around about the nature of these stones that are, that are meant there. It's interesting uh, that what is the most precious thing on earth is not there, the mm -hmm. diamond. And uh, it has to do with the breaking index of light and precious stones have one quality. These precious stones have one quality and the others have different qualities. And uh, there, are, there are lots of stories about that. But what's interesting is that there are no diamonds. Now, a diamond is compressed carbon, right? Mm. Oh, and dead a, debris. Yes, and a diamond is formed when you have tremendous pressure in volcanic tubes. Mm. And that compresses the carbon. So the diamond is actually a post-flood phenomenon. Yeah. It's a catastrophic element. It's interesting that a product of catastrophe should be the most precious thing on this earth. True. But these stones reflect the light and are translucent to the light. And these are the real uh, precious stones that will be there. So you have uh, the jasper and the sapphire and the, all of these and the emerald and it mentions all the stones. And the gates are pearls. Now a pearl in this world is formed when there is an irritant in the creature like a grain of sand and it covers it over to be made smooth. So a pearl is a symbol of a beautiful product that came out of suffering. Mm. So it's a nice symbol of what the gates are made of. The gates are a beautiful symbol of a great suffering that has been uh, experienced by all. I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. We are worshiping a real God we're not going to be uh, subject to specific buildings, but we have a face-to-face -face contact. And it had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, because the glory of the Lord lighted it. That doesn't mean there won't no. be a sun. Like you said earlier, this is in the city. Correct. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth to bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, and there shall be no night there. So you have free access, no lockdown. There's no lockdown in this city. The, the gates are open. If you want to visit someone, you can you go. Can no mask either. No mask. No. No, because you'll see face to face, face not to mask face. to mask. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So there has to be some character development if you want to be part of this. Now if we go to some other portions of the Bible, we can glean some more information. Now we want to get into what the city will be like. We want to speculate a little, right? And some people will say, oh, they're conspiratorial even when, <laughs> when, it, comes to the <laughs> when it comes to the history. Even. But that's fine. Let those that are so narrow-minded that they cannot think outside the box remain in their box, and we'll, we'll, as long as they're happy in their box, right? Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6 says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Now, I gave a lecture uh, many years ago called Creation to Restoration, where I look at the scientific aspects of the animals that are now carnivorous yes. that originally were probably not carnivorous, and we looked at some scientific evidence for that and some experiments that were even yes. done. And maybe you can put a link I'll in. I'll put a link into that. Yeah, creation to restoration. You also mentioned in that one, if I remember correctly, that the lion, for instance, the first thing it eats is the stomach. Yes, the, the, the strong lion gets, yes. gets the stomach content. Which actually almost makes him also... Yeah, herbivorous yeah. to some extent. <laughs> Correct. Now, there are two things that happen here. They change their diets and they change their dispositions. They become gentle and mild. There's no more aggression because even a little child will lead them. Mm. Humanity is back in charge and the animals are gentle and loving and playful and kind. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. You know, we have little glimpses of that in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, if a cat and a dog become friends, they become inseparable. Yeah. And you have these trans-species relationships yes. of animals, and even lions adopting a little buck. Yeah. So there are very strange stories out there which tell us that originally, mm -hmm. yeah, there, there are glimpses in a sick world. And the sucking child shall play in the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockroach's den. In other words, the snake will no longer be poisonous. Mm -hmm. It will be restored to whatever beauty it had before. And they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So what will our relationship be like with the animal world? Very um, intertwined. And indescribable. Yeah. You will have a relationship like you can only dream of in this world. Mm -hmm. We only have many glimpses of a greater reality. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then we will see you know, as it really yeah, is. Um, I, I'm sure we'll also see uh, animals that are now extinct. Absolutely. Dinosaurs. I cannot wait to slide down a brontosaurus's <laughs> neck. <laughs> and then we will be active. You will have a house in the city because the Lord is preparing a dwelling place. But when the earth is made new after the thousand years, then you will build houses and you will inhabit them and you shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. In other words, you will have a city house, a city dwelling, and you will have a country dwelling. And whatever that is, what will happen? You will build and not another inhabit. There will be no government regulation which disinherits you. <laughs> no fines for moving dead trees. Nothing. 
<laughs> no fines for moving dead trees. Yeah, that was a very interesting moment in my life, to be fined for moving a dead tree. Unbelievable. <laughs> they shall not plant and another eat. Oh, uh, no, I'm sorry, but there won't be any dead trees. There won't be any dead trees to move. Yes, <laughs> you're right. They will not plant and another eat. That's interesting. Now, in other words, rerum novarum won't be active in heaven. It no. will be part of history. One part will be a little bit true. There will be no borders. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. As for the days of a tree or the days of my people and mine elect shall long enjoy the works of their hands. This means that uh, you will actually be able to enjoy the fruits of your labor, but you're welcome to come and eat yeah. one of my avocados, as long as you don't overdo it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring is with them. This is a reality. Mm. This is what heaven is going to be like. This is not a spiritual cloud nine sitting with a, with a musical instrument, a harp. Yeah. Heavenly knowledge will be progressive. All the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. Unfettered by mortality, they wing their tireless flight to worlds afar. Everybody wants to have extraterrestrial space travel, right? Yeah. And here you'll be able to go to worlds afar. Tireless. Other inhabited areas, creations of God. Worlds that thrilled with sorrow at the spectacle of human woe and rang with songs of gladness at the tidings of a ransomed soul. With unutterable delight, the children of earth enter into the joy and the wisdom of unfallen beings. They share the treasures of knowledge and understanding gained through the ages upon ages in contemplation of God's handiwork. Now it's interesting that the new education mm -hmm. tells us that we shouldn't jump too far. We should be limited. Yeah. And this tells us you should be unlimited. Yes. With undimmed vision, they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns and stars and systems, all in their appointed order, circling the throne of deity. Upon all things from the least to the greatest, the Creator's name is written, and in all are the riches of His power displayed. It's interesting that they circle the throne of deity. deity. There is a central point in the universe. Mm. So we will not be just an infinitesimal speck somewhere in the outer regions of an enormous universe. This will be the center of all. Yes. Now, it's interesting that people always say, you know, Man was so primitive in the beginning and we are so advanced. And some people believe, you know, I don't want to go to heaven because everything will be so primitive. Yeah. Now, who was the creator of everything? Jesus Christ, right? Yes. And we can only harness what has already been created. Yes. So if there are certain wavelengths that exist in our realm, whether they be ultraviolet rays, mm -hmm. infrared rays, X-rays, yes. microwaves, or whatever wave we want to talk about, we can harness them. Mm -hmm. And we can create cell phones, and, and we can create it. instruments to record them. But God created them for a purpose. And we can communicate with them. We can send information. We can send pictures across the, the waves. Yeah. Now, what if you were actually an instrument that could receive all of the waves? What if your eyes were capable of not only telescopic vision, like an eagle, yeah. but also 
microscopic microscopic yeah. so that you could actually and x-ray vision that you could look into something to see what the mechanisms mm -hmm. are what if you were a receiver for microwaves then you wouldn't need a cell phone we could communicate yeah. with each other does god know what you are thinking yes when angels communicate with heaven do they know what you are thinking yes they must be able to read the mind now we've discussed that in a previous yes. one already about well, what the capability of the restored humanity will be. Yeah, because we discussed it actually in that episode where we showed that they're trying to do this on Earth already. Yes. With that Neuralink implant and all this stuff. Exactly. Things. They're trying to, to get close to what it was before, but they won't ever quite be able to do it, right? Yeah. No. And the capacity that the brain has. I mean, if you go to Pentecost and uh, people were given languages, mm. sometimes multiple languages in an instant, uh, that wasn't tedious study to, to get uh, the hang of a new language, right? Yeah. It was instantaneous. So a brain that is so efficient that if it sees something, stores it forever, it will be amazing. So... Is it really true that mankind has been so primitive and has slowly, slowly advanced to where we are now? Or were they super brilliant in the past and we lost it all until we were, you know, without wheels even at one stage yeah. and then went back to where we are today? Mm -hmm. So let's have a look at some of the evidence and our people will say, okay, Maybe they're being conspiratorial. Here is a, a web page that talks about... This is actually a tourist web page where they take you to some of these sites where they talk about the largest and mysterious ancient megalithic cut stones of Baalbek, Lebanon. Now, I was actually there and I looked at the ruins of the Baalbek temple and I went to the quarries where they actually dig these things up. And as you go through this, you'll see stones of that magnitude that are cut out of solid rock. Mm. And this is a particular one that was rejected because it had a flaw in it. But others were transported many miles across terrain like this and built into temples. Mm. Now, this is, of course, a limestone, a rock, and it is a post-flood phenomenon. So this comes from the post-Diluvian world. Mm. So this is just after the flood. Now, people are wondering, you know, they must have been very primitive people. No, they were very advanced. Now, how advanced were they and what knowledge did they bring with them? Remember, they had this massive capacity. Mm. They were huge. They were twice our size, yes. at least twice our size, if not more. And they had a technology that we can only dream of. But we have this portrayal of evolution that we come yeah. from monkey monkeys and uh, cavemen. And cavemen that bash each other over the head, etc. And nothing could be further from the truth. So when we talk about some of these technologies, then eye has not seen nor ear has heard what the technologies in heaven are going to be no. like. The technologies that you speak about now, we don't even have technology today to do those types of... Cannot, we cannot cut it out like that, yeah. and we cannot transport it. Yeah. So how did these people do this? So they cut out these huge stones... So here's an archaeological site in Lebanon, and later it became uh, the city of the sun in Roman times. Here you can see some of these giant buildings and these massive stones in the foundations. And they were built on top of, of ruins even, some of them. And they are absolutely huge. I mean, just look at the size of these mm. things. They are absolutely amazing. 
And you ask yourselves, how did they cut them with such precision? This one was still waiting to be transported, but it was rejected. And then you have this one. Look at the size of it. Can we do that today? Now, not only do you cut it out in this fashion, you also have to cut it out from underneath. Yeah. Now, that other one came straight out of the ground. You can understand how you can cut along the edge, but you must have very specific tools, yeah. right? <laughs> but they are so precise. Yeah. Is it possible that they used lasers? But then how did they cut the underneath out? How did you make that light go at 90 degrees to cut underneath? That's a technology we don't have. Yes. So there's no doubt that, that this technology was absolutely amazing. There you see some of these rocks. We would not be able to transport them. And you find them all over the world. Yeah. Not only at Baalbek. To even further complicate the enigmas of Baalbek, the accuracy of the stone fitting is remarkable. Michael Aluf, the former curator of the ruins, wrote of the trilithon, in spite of their immense size, they are so accurately placed in position and so carefully joined that it is almost impossible to insert a needle between them. No description will give an exact idea of the bewildering and stupefying effect of these tremendous blocks on the spectator. We don't have those technologies today. No. There are other interesting things, and one of them is this. Researchers find proof of ancient atomic war a great many years prior. Did our old precursors have very trend-setting innovations matching the atomic abilities of today? There is proof from remnants in India supporting that guarantee. There are additionally antiquated fantasies which depict scenes coordinating our cutting-edge comprehension of nuclear fighting. Writings from a great many years prior appear to contain what could be deciphered as precise portrayals of atomic blasts, particularly identical to the ones in Nagasaki in World War II, Take the incomparable Sanskrit epic from India called the Mahabharata. It accounts fate and devastation with entries that appear to precisely portray the impact and repercussions of an atomic war. Now, there are web pages that talk about a worldwide war. Mm. Now, how long ago was that? Now, some web pages, of course, talk about hundreds of thousands yeah. or even millions of years. We don't have to speculate millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years. If you start with one couple in Eden and you take current growth rates, which take into account death yes. and wars and famines and all of those issues, then from one pair, how long would it take to reach the current population of Seven billion. Thousand. Thousand two hundred years mm. should do it. Given that growth is an exponential. If you start with three couples, as in the days of Noah, mm. then of course it will be much shorter. Yes. So you could reach that, uh, that number in uh, four to five hundred years. Now, if you had that much of a population, and at the time after Noah, when Nimrod built yeah. his cities and they built the Tower of Babel and the nations separated, the enemy must have been very upset with this brilliant strategic move by God to confuse the languages and separate the nations. He's been trying ever since then to unite to them. Unite them again, yes. Yeah? That's why he has an organization today called the United Nations. Correct. But God kept them separate so that we would not forget our dependence upon him. Mm -hmm. Because if you have constant conflict around you and you have to watch your back, you are dependent upon God, right? So is it possible 
that there were even nuclear wars to try and bring them together again? Did they have that technology? Yes. Well, to what apparently, yes. Apparently, there are buried cities that to this day are still radioactive, so they claim. But be that as it may, here is a, a, an article which talks about these things, and then it gives evidence for these very things. Some of these cities that have been uh, abandoned, they have these great granite blocks that have become vitrified, they've turned to glass. Yeah. So there was heat that was involved there, incredible heat like you would expect in a nuclear explosion. So maybe they weren't as stupid as, as we think. Mm. And maybe in the aftermath of such a cataclysmic event, and we have all these impact craters which could derive from nuclear impacts. Maybe after that, mankind went back into a primitive phase and had to rebuild. Many people became isolated yeah. and became even more and more uh, regressive in terms of knowledge. But when you incorporate them back into a society with knowledge, very rapidly they are capable of... Uh, learning yeah. at the same rate as anybody else. Here's another one that's very interesting. And this web page says, 17 out-of-place artifacts said to suggest high-tech prehistoric civilizations existed. They don't understand this. Yeah, because their mind can't think of a... You, you have been so indoctrinated in thinking primitive to advanced. Yeah. Whereas in actual fact, you went from advanced to primitive back to advanced. Advance. That's exactly. what happened. So in this web page, they talk about some of these things. Well, let's just look at some of them. And it talks about, according to the conventional views of history, humans have only walked the earth in our present form for some 200,000 years. We won't go with their numbers, <laughs> right? Advanced civilizations appeared several thousand years ago, but much of the mechanical ingenuity we know in modern times began to develop only around the Industrial Revolution a couple of hundreds of years ago. Out-of-place artifacts, art, is a term applied to dozens of prehistoric objects found in various places around the world that seem to show a level of technological advancement in Congress with the times in which they were made. Instruments like batteries that we do not even understand the technology of, cathode ray tubes, all kinds of artifacts have been found, metals of such purity that we cannot even produce them in our furnaces to this day. Where do these things come from? And if you go down and scroll down on these web pages, you find uh, clay jars, what they seem to say is a light bulb, uh, walls in places where they shouldn't be, nuclear reactor sites, they found uh, purified uranium mm. and uh, that could only be as a result of a high technology. Did they have nuclear plants and uh, what people think about these issues and uh, whether you go to Brazil or whether you go to South America or whether you go to China or India and uh, pipes that they found in the in the rocks and you know these are supposed to be millions of years old and yet they are buried in these sites or instruments like this a 2000 year old mechanical device used to calculate the position of the sun moon and the stars have been found many many interesting artifacts here is a metal uh, iron pillar that shows no rust. It's a technology that we're not able to, to even copy in the times that we live in. And then a sword displayed in Germany, which is such high quality as well, the steel. 
that we would think that this is not possible in the times uh, that we're talking about here. And then there are other interesting ones. And now we're getting into very controversial eras. These are hieroglyphics, and people are saying, but, but what are these things? What is that? It looks like a, a helicopter. helicopter. And what is this? And of course they're saying, no, it's not a helicopter. This looks like a transport aeroplane. Yes. And they actually found models of these things. And they're saying, no, 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 this is something else. It just looks like that. Because mankind cannot conceive of these things. Yeah, that's so here, word. for example, you have this one compared with that one. And uh, submarines. submarines. <laughs> Interesting. And aeroplanes and models such as this. Now, what is interesting? Now, I'm not going to go there. I'm just saying that we must look at the world with different eyes. If you want to look at hidden archaeology and what really happened in the past, then the picture that has been portrayed mm -hmm. is very skewed. Yeah, the education that they put into the world. Correct. Terrible. Why did Adolf Hitler or when the war was about to start, send the largest archaeological team in history to Egypt. Why did he send Rommel and his army mm. to secure Egypt? Mm. And they started these digs. Now he was, of course, an occultist. Yes. And he had occult information. Mm -hmm. And he was looking for technology. Yes. And we don't know to this day what he found. We don't know what happens in those secret laboratories where these German scientists that came out of that war situation mm -hmm. were all employed. Whether it was in Russia or whether it was in, in the USA. United States of America is irrelevant. Where did they get hold of technologies that suddenly exploded? Yeah and brought about the times that we are living in. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden. All of a sudden. And how is it possible that uh, those armies in Germany developed a GPS system which was so accurate when there were no satellites at that stage? And when you think about these things, you're wondering, have we had the wool pulled over our eyes? Okay, now we don't want to speculate, and we don't want to make conspiracy theories. The fact of the matter is, there is proof enough, if you want to look for it, that what existed in the past is so technologically advanced in many cases that we cannot comprehend it to this day. What the antediluvian world looked like, we will never know. Where is the antediluvian world? Why do we not find more of these things if there was a culture pre-flood that had millions of people, probably more than we have oh, to millions. this day, and they lived in great cities. Mm -hmm. Where are these cities? Now, we do have cities today. Mm -hmm. Some of them of the Easter Islands, they are under the ocean, ocean, and you can go and dive and go and see technology there that boggles the mind, and how did they move all these things, but that's all post-flood. What was it like pre-flood? It is highly probable that that entire civilization today is buried under the ocean. Mm. And there where the evidence of the flood is the greatest, there humanity resided. The greatest canyons that you find on this planet are not where the Grand Canyon is, but canyons four times greater than that are under the Pacific Ocean. So that means that's a flood phenomenon. So buried under that ocean are the cities. That's where you get the legends of Atlantis from. That the old civilization disappeared under the sea. But that technology, the demons know about that yep. technology. And here at the end of time, we are discovering some of these things. It's but Solomon says, there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. We think we are the bee's knees. Yeah. 
we are nothing. So if this is what fallen yes. humanity could do, this is the whole point. Yeah. Now forget about conspiracies, forget about this or that, or the, whether this is 100% accurate or that. If this is what fallen humanity can do, what is unfallen humanity going to be capable of? All right, so let's go back to our Bible and to what we can glean, and also from the spirit of prophecy. And we read here in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, As Adam came forth from the hand of his Creator, he was of noble height and of beautiful symmetry. He was more than twice as tall as men now living upon earth and was well proportioned. His features were perfect and beautiful. Now, people will say, but this is conjecture. No, this is what's written in the spirit of prophecy, and it is collaborated in the Bible, yes. because the Bible explains what some of these post-Diluvians were like, yeah. and it describes the size of their beds, Correct. which is more than double of what we have today. Yes. And so this is true. This and the is giants that lived on the earth. Absolutely. And then also, maybe if they just want to realize when God created Adam, he created him perfect. He created him himself. Correct. So Now if we stand up in this building, and this building is three meters high, then Adam would have to crawl in this place, right? Mm. Now what were the temples like or the buildings that they built? They must have been huge. Massive. And that's what we find. That's exactly what we find. So his features were perfect and beautiful. His complexion was neither white nor sallow, but ruddy, reddish, hmm. glowing with the rich tint of health. Eve was not quite as tall as Adam. Her head reached a little above his shoulders. She too was noble, perfect in symmetry, and very beautiful. It's interesting that symmetry actually makes beauty. The more symmetrical a face, if you take a mirror and you look at the one half as to the other, they're very different today. They're not absolutely perfect. And the greater the symmetry, the more it is associated with beauty. It's just a scientific uh, little misnomer. But they were very beautiful. They were very huge. They were strong. They could do things that we can only dream of. As the years of eternity, as they roll, will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ. As knowledge is progressive, so will love, reverence, and happiness increase. The more men learn of God, the greater will be their admiration of his character. So there are two aspects here. Great technological knowledge. Mm -hmm. Great opportunities that do not we cannot even dream of. Yes. And then also the depth of the character of, of God, God. To study that character of God. Who's this God that unlike any other of the deities on this planet was prepared to die for you and me while we were yet sinners? Unbelievable. Mm. And then to bear with us as we struggle. <laughs> what about social life? There we will know even as also we are known. There the loves and sympathies that God has planted in the soul will find truest and sweetest exercise. The pure communion with holy beings, the harmonious social life with the blessed angels and with the faithful ones of all ages, the sacred fellowship that binds together the whole family in heaven and on earth, all are among the experiences of the hereafter. I'd love to sit and have a chat with Paul. Mm. Wouldn't you? Yeah, well, there's a quite a few people that I would like to sit down I and chat with. I think we're going to have some interesting talks. One that I've definitely got on my list is Luther. I want to talk to Luther. <laughs> and uh, I want to talk to some of the antediluvians. Mm. But uh, I'll probably be a, get a stiff neck from looking up and <laughs> talking to them. It'll take a while to grow. Yeah. Apparently... You will grow in stature until you have reached your full potential. I'm going to take a while to get to my full stature. And you're going to have your hair back? Yeah. You're going to have a crop of hair. <laughs> Remember Absalom? <laughs> yeah. How how 3.6 kilograms <laughs> for one cut. 
Mine is 3.1 milligrams. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is even less. <laughs> Yours is even less. Psalms 29 verse 9. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to carve and discovereth the forests. And in his temple does everyone speak of his glory. This is not arrogance on the part of God. You will just be so amazed that you will just say, wow. Yeah. Don't you think so? I'm looking forward to it. Someone once said to me, I may not use the word wow. Okay. He said it had an occult origin. So I said, okay, I'll only speak it backwards from now <laughs> on. <laughs> <laughs> so what will be your occupation? In the earth made new, the redeemed will engage in the occupations and pleasures that brought happiness to Adam and Eve in the beginning. The Eden life will be lived, the life in garden and field. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the works of their hands. That's an eternity. There every power will be developed, every capability increased. The grandest enterprises will be carried forward. The loftiest aspirations will be reached. Without selfishness. If you read this, then you can probably get a, a grasp of you don't have to want to reach all of this on earth. No. On this miserable place where we are sitting where at wind stage. and storm just sweep it away but if if you put into the mix unselfishness here uh, ambition to override everyone else but just the knowledge that you can gain and the experience and and the joy of it unbelievable why would you want to be here if you can go there the highest ambitions realized and still there will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to call forth the power of body and mind and soul. You may study that love for ages. This is the climax, mm -hmm. getting to know God. I mean, even Einstein says he wants to see the face of God. I want to see the mind of God. I want to see the character of God. I want to be able to look into his eyes. I want to be able to see that compassion mm. that he had when he healed the disease. I want to be able to see it for myself. And the breadth and the depth and the height of the love of God in giving his son to die for the world. Eternity itself can never fully reveal it. Yet as we study the Bible and meditate upon the life of Christ and the plan of redemption, these great themes will open to our understanding more and more. And it will be ours to realize the blessing which Paul desired for the Ephesian church when he prayed, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. I don't know whether it's happened to you, but this book here, this Bible, every time I read it, I'm reading a new book. Yeah. No, it definitely happened to me. Has it happened it, to you? It happens regularly. <laughs> this is the only book I've ever read that is new every time I read it because I discover things that I never thought were even remotely written there. And I sometimes wonder, why didn't you see that? Yeah. And the next time you read it, you see things again where you wonder, why didn't I see that? Yeah, and sometimes you wonder, is it really standing here? I didn't know it was standing in the yeah. Bible, like this in the Bible. You know, when or you give Bible studies to people and they want to, you know, be otherwise, and then they confront it with a verse in the Bible which totally shatters their worldview. 
And some will say, no, I can't accept that. I'd rather accept what my minister has to say. But I want to know what really is in this book because we're just scratching the surface. Hebrews 10, verse 35 and onwards. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Again, I want to reiterate, don't slip down the slippery slope of spiritualism. This is reality. Mm. It has substance. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Isaiah says in chapter 35 verse 10, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Don't look at this world. Be in another world. Otherwise you will go Insane. Yes, depressed. How many people commit suicide? Mm. The suicide rate has soared in this year because of all the depression, because of what is being fed to humanity. You know, yeah, rather put your hope in this than in an earthly type savior that will try and make some little bit of a better place. Exactly. If you are in a war, and you're fighting in a trench, and you're at the point of despair, and you hear the message that tomorrow you will be free and go back to your wife and children, your loved ones, are you going to commit suicide? No. Or are you going to stick it out for another day? Yeah. yeah, stick it out. Isaiah 51 verse 3, For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden and a desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found there in thanksgiving and the voice of melody. You're going to sing. Yeah. My wife will be so happy. She loves, you love singing, right? Yes. Yes, you've got this booming voice. You're such a small guy. You've got <laughs> this huge voice. Small bottle with lots of poison. <laughs> <laughs> And then it gives this promise, as well as the singers, as the players on instruments shall be there, all my springs are in thee. In other words, all the capacity to produce the very best. I mean, let's face it, some of the music that you listen to today <laughs> is just depressing, isn't it? <laughs> and it's all the same. And it all has the same beat. If I switch on that radio and it goes doof, 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 and then my dad used to always say when I said to him when we were having a party or whatever, he said, but it's all the same. I said to him, no, but you have to listen to this and this. I said, it's all doof, doof, doof. <laughs> <laughs> and now I agree. That's <laughs> <laughs> what it is. And they, they, they add lyrics and the lyrics, because they run out of lyrics later, they are so ridiculous sometimes that you wonder, you know, where's the Shakespearean element? Isaiah chapter 24 verse 14 says, They shall lift up their voice, they shall sing for the majesty of the Lord, and they shall cry aloud from the sea. I think our croaky voices, at least mine, hmm. will again join in. I always thought, you know, Gabriel will say, uh, <laughs> You can play the triangle <laughs> <laughs> and don't sing. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> but I don't think so. Well, I've heard you. It's not that bad. <laughs> Jude says in chapter 1, verse 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God and our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and and ever. Amen. Amen. My brother, we are going home a little while. Just hang in there Amen. and we will experience things that eye has not seen nor ear has heard. Looking forward to it. Let's Amen. pray. Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for the promise of heaven. Thank you for a place without pain. Thank you for a place of eternal growth in knowledge and wisdom and understanding. Thank you for the presence of the Lamb that was slain who will rule the entire universe with one harmonious note. Thank you and make us able to accept the reality of these things and not to spiritualize them. May those who have watched be uplifted. May our thoughts be directed heavenward, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.